I needn't do anything now, need I? <laughs> oh, that was very, very nice. I was going to tap dance, actually, but they, they've put carpet down. Cost my mother half a crown a week, you know, for me to have tap dancing lessons. They came in very useful, because that reminds me. I used to give concerts, you see, in our backyard, because it was the end of the war, just towards the end of the war, and the blackout curtains were no longer needed. So the blackout curtains used to go on the clothesline. And I gave these concerts. That was just before I turned into Bonnie Langford. <laughs> It was, no, it, it, was, it was a really good time, actually. Uh, but then I went to school, obviously. Well, it's not obvious, I know. But uh, uh, <laughs> I went to school and I had a most wonderful uh, headmaster who was stage-struck. And um, one day a message came from the local repertory company. I was 13 by this time, so, you know, a lot of tap dancing and a lot of uh, concerts in the backyard had gone under the bridge. And he said, Inman, you're an idiot. <laughs> you keep telling everybody you want to go on the stage. Get down to the South Pier, which is in Blackpool, and learn these words. And I got this job with the local repertory company when I was 13. So I've been on the stage since I was 13. And I'm getting a bit tired now. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was a long, it was a long time ago. I went to and worked for them when I left school. And I swept up and I made tea and I did all those sort of things. And then I went on tour proper. I got myself a proper job on the stage doing almost everything. And my mum, uh, bless her, she lives in this little fishing village on the northwest coast of England called Blackpool. She sits there <laughs> with a little lace cap and a rocking chair and whatnot. She sits there. And actually, at the moment, she's in a home for the totally bewildered. Uh, <laughs> and I shall be joining her very soon. <laughs> but, uh, oh, oh, yes, yes. She, she worked in a factory, you see, my mum, uh, in, in a machine factory. In fact, she taught me to sew. That's how, uh, how I know how to use a sewing machine. And she worked in this factory, and I went on tour to Blackpool, to the Grand Theatre Blackpool, a very long time ago, in a play called While the Sun Shines. And I don't know whether you know or not that in those days the management could get a train for nothing. He could get tickets for his cast if he took a coach for the scenery and a coach for the furniture. So that's how we did tours up and down the country on a train. And we hit Blackpool and I was a stage manager and I had a small part. And um, we got there and we got the scenery in to the Grand Theatre and, of course, I had very cheap digs that week. I was staying with my mother, so that was all right. <laughs> and we suddenly realised that the coach with all the furniture hadn't arrived. And I didn't know quite what to do. Now, I can't drive, as it happens, but our ASM could drive, and he had a little, I think it was called a Luton van, just big enough to take some furniture. So we whizzed round to my mother's house, 83 Sherburn Road. <laughs> And I... You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I emptied the front room and the hall. And it all went into the back of this van. And it ended up on the stage of the Grand Theatre. And it all looked very, very nice. The three-piece suite, the standard lamp, the coffee table, the pictures <laughs> off the walls and everything else. And I managed to get home just before she phoned the police. <laughs> Well, love, she'd, she'd no furniture. And I managed, I managed to explain, well, she wasn't well pleased. But the outcome is that she did actually go to the theatre to see the play every single night. <laughs> because she felt more at home in the Grand Theatre. <laughs> no, she, she put up with it really quite well. And, and then, uh, I suppose, came along a uh, pantomime, I started... I started doing pantomimes. I've always done... I've done 40-odd pantomimes. It's a lot, isn't it, really? Um, I remember doing a pantomime with uh, a friend of mine, Barry Howard, who you probably remember. We, we were playing Ugly Sisters uh, together, and uh, we did a Cinderella at uh, Streatham Theatre. It was a cinema 
most of the time, and, and uh, I don't know whether you realise, it, but it's a heck of a long way from the stage to the front row in a cinema. So we used to walk down off the stage and say hello to everybody along the front row of the audience so that they had a good look at us, then they knew what we looked like, you see. <laughs> we used to call it the ice cream run, because it's where <laughs> everything's coming your way, here comes the girl with the tray. You know, that... <laughs> uh, walk up and down there. And uh, they had a strange staff there. They were all related. There were seven of them, the crew there. And we used to call them the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> because they were all a bit daft. <laughs> and uh, one day, we had our wardrobe mistress, actually, was a man. You wouldn't know it. Oh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, not by the way he walked, anyway. So, uh, but... Um, that was our wardrobe. I won't mention his name. He's still alive and kicking uh, and walking. But he, he used to get quite drunk, actually. He, he liked to drink. And um, he used to drink rosé wine. I don't know why, but we sussed this out because all our white gloves used to come back pink. <laughs> and we swore blindly kept it in the washing machine. <laughs> so one day his washing machine blew up her terrible mess and everybody's running up and down saying to the Magnificent Seven phone the fire brigade get the fire brigade because it was a big theatre Stratomodian it was you know so they dash down to the telephone to the stage door and they're so daft these seven fellows they're going through the phone book <laughs> you know, right and he says is it under F or B <laughs> <laughs> wonderful time we had actually doing the pantomime and, and we had a guy, we had a conjurer. Why do they have conjurers in pantomime? We had a conjurer who used to load himself up with doves. And he, he couldn't walk. He was absolutely, <laughs> absolutely rigid, he, he was. And Barry and I used to finish our boudoir scene with a big um, gun, a blunderbuss. We used to get into bed the night before the ball. And he used to say to me, we'll protect ourselves, dear. Hang on to that. And I had the gun, and then he used to say, whatever you do, don't pull that trigger. And I used to say, what, you mean this one? Bang! And the bed shot up in the air, and we vanished through the scenery. And just as this conjurer was walking past. <laughs> and everything went like... <laughs> All the birds tremor, and he, all he could say was a bit foreign. All he could say was, don't fake the birds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made a decision very early on, because I, I did a lot of rep. And when you're in a rep company, you play what you are given. You have to. I mean, the director says, this is what you're doing this week, and that's what you play. And that is how you find out what you're best at. Um, I am the world's worst inspector. <laughs> oh. I look ridiculous in a raincoat and a trilby. I really, I really do. <laughs> and I was, I was in a rep company in Chester. And uh, two little old ladies used to come every week. Well, all the audience used to come every week because it was... Different play every week. Same company, but different play. And these little old ladies used to sit in the front. And um, I'd played, oh, I think three or four comedy parts. Really good ones. I'd, I'd enjoyed them very much. And then I was thrust with this thing in my hand, an inspector in an Agatha Christie or something like that. Where were you on the night of the 14th? Of the, oh... <laughs> Terrible to learn, and boring, really. There are people that can play inspectors, you know, and there are people that can't. And I'm one that can't, and Morse is one that can. You know, really. <laughs> uh, so, I came on in this raincoat and trilby, because I didn't know what else inspectors wore. And as I came on, this little old lady turned to her friend and said, Oh, no, <laughs> you'll like him, he'll make you laugh. <laughs> You see, when it's too quiet, I think everybody's gone home. 
<laughs> and and I find it I don't find it difficult to learn other people's words because there are some some good writers. I've done some marvelous plays, but they've always been funny. Not, not always hysterically funny, but I mean a marvelous play I did quite a lot is a play called My Fat Friend. And it isn't all funny. But my god there's some big belting laughs just around the corner, you know. That's what I like, really. It's finding out, I suppose, what you're best at. And a, quite a few years ago, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I would become a laughter machine. Uh, and that is what I am now. And uh, my next job will be to put a lot of frocks on and be Widow Twanky in Aladdin at Woking and um, kick my legs and uh, get a lot of laughs. I hope. <laughs> I was so fortunate in 1976, I'd done so many pantomimes, I was really fortunate because I was asked what pantomime I would like to do. And it's quite an honour that, you know, before all that, I, I did what I was given. But when they say, now, well, you know, what do you want to do? And it was a big theatre, Wimbledon Theatre. And I said, I would like to do Mother Goose. So I did, because it was always my favourite pantomime as a kid. Because I remember this beautiful white goose peeping round scenery and coming on to beautiful music. And that was the subject that I wanted to do very much. And it was at that time, while I was rehearsing that, that they did my This Is Your Life. Quite a, a, a traumatic day. Uh, my dresser, Ron, who looked after me and everything, uh, on the morning, he knew I didn't on the morning it was going to happen. And I was going to spend the day in the church hall with the little babes, the little dancers, doing Teddy Bear's Picnic, rehearsing it, you see. So I thought, well, I don't really need, I don't need a shave, I don't need uh, oh, I, you know, <laughs> put my jeans on, anything, an old pullover. I should be in a dirty old church hall. So in I went and I rehearsed. Now, Ron says to me, are you not going to have a shave? <laughs> no, I'm going to be in a church hall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going like that, are you? Yes, yes, I am. I'm going like that. Mm. So he was stuck, poor soul. So I go and I do, I do all this, and they're all preparing behind the scenes. They're all preparing this. This is your life. We hadn't opened, you see. And so they said, "Will you do this program called What's On in London?" today. So I said, well, look at me. Oh, is it? That, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. They want to do what's on in London because it'll be very good for business. And I don't think there was a pantomime at the Palladium that year. Uh, so, and it was Wimbledon, big theatre, what's on in London, Mother Goose, will you do it? I said, yes, all right. So we started to rehearse the little extract that we were going to do. And Bill Roberton, who was the director of the pantomime, and at that time, my manager, said, right, now we come on, and, and Mother Goose, you come on and say, oh, the squire is going to turn me out of the cottage. Will no one save me from this wicked man? And he said, and there'll be a big puff of smoke. I said, oh, yes, and then Eamon will come on with his red book and say, hold everything. And he said to me, don't mess about. <laughs> of course he won't. Don't mess about. And... Everybody, the blood drained from them, you see, because <laughs> they thought I knew. And in actual fact, I didn't. I was only doing a joke, and I got shouted at uh, for, for doing this joke. Anyway, that is what happened eventually. I was dressed as Mother Goose, my little grey wig, and I got my little eyebrows and my wire glasses and my frock and, my, and everything. Uh, it was all together. And Eamon comes on. This is your life, right? And he said, now, well, just get changed and go to the studio. Well, Ron, bless him, he'd brought my shoes, my socks, my suit, tie, shirt, everything. Everything I needed he had brought down to the theatre. The only thing he didn't bring was the removing cream <laughs> to take my face off. <laughs> so I travelled in a big limousine with a very nice suit on all the way to Thames Studio with Mother Goose's face. <laughs> it's a great experience. 
Well, then we come to Are You Being Served, you see. It was round about that time. Are You Being Served was really quite wonderful. And uh, during uh, This Is Your Life, I, I learnt uh, this wonderful little story. Because, you know, Are You Being Served was very successful, and it still is all over the world. And um, David Croft, bless him, went to see uh, Bill Cotton, who was then head of uh, Light Entertainment, and he said, I've got loads more, we've got everything ready to go, we've got more episodes, would you like them? And he said, yes, yes, we'll have those, but get rid of the puff. (laughs) (laughs) What a misguided man. (laughs) And bless him, David Croft said, if the puff goes, I go. (laughs) We've no show. And I didn't know that until the night of my This Is Your Life, because David Croft whispered that to me. <laughs> um, oh, and that reminds me. Now, I was in Amsterdam, because, you know, the show was popular here, there and everywhere. And um, I don't know whether you know this, but in Amsterdam, shops close on a Monday. That's their half-day closing, I think. They closed all Monday morning or something like that. Some, some places it's Wednesday or Thursday, isn't it? When It doesn't happen anymore, but it, it used to. You know. uh, and in Amsterdam, Monday, it's a funny day, but it probably gave them a long weekend. And I was there on a Monday, and I was having some photographs taken on a bridge, a pretty bridge over a canal. And there's two little ladies walking, and, of course, they're speaking Dutch. And the crew, the camera crew and the people taking photographs, started to laugh. And I said to them, I said, what did they say that made you laugh so much? And he said, well, one of them said to the other, oh, look, there's Mr Humphreys from the shop. What is he doing here? <laughs> and the other one said, well, it's half-day closing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, we progress. Things go on, and... Um, are You Being Served becomes very, very popular in America, uh, where, of course, they don't speak English at all. <laughs> they, don't, you know, they have an entirely different, uh, a different vocabulary. Uh, I only knew bits of words, American words, uh, through watching old Betty Grable films and things like that, you know, uh, like Sidewalk and Fawcett and p- things like that. So, again, a wonderful time I had um, in... Um, San Francisco, it was marvellous. I was uh, trying to cross the road, and of course you look the wrong way, don't you, you see, when you're used to it. Uh, and I was looking the wrong way. And this cyclist uh, went past and screamed, We love you, Mr Humphreys! <laughs> and fell off his bike. <laughs> he was really concerned as to how I was going to cross, cross the road. You know, the sweet, sweet people... They, uh, they ask a lot of questions, the, the, the Yanks. They're very nosy people. They want to know, Hey, John, have you ever met the Queen? <laughs> now, for somebody to ask you that in San Francisco is a very... <laughs> it's a very strange question. <laughs> I said, well, yes, I have, as a matter of fact. I said, I don't know whether you know or not, but she's on all our postage stamps. <laughs> So when I met her, I recognised her. <laughs> I didn't know whether to shake her hand or lick her neck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they do, they ask, they ask all sorts of questions. We got, to, very late, we got to San Francisco. I was with uh, my, my manager, Bill Roberton, in those days. And uh, <clears throat> we got to the Marriott Hotel. Now, I don't know whether you know or not, you've probably been to these very, very big hotels, hundreds and hundreds of rooms and everything. But if you check in late, the only person that is in charge of this huge place is usually a little Chinese girl (laughs) who sits very sweetly at the desk. Oh, yes, hello, yeah, Mm mm-hmm. Ah, oh, Mr. Inman, yes, and Mr. Roberton, uh-huh. And then they've got this thing in front of them, and they go... Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, two room. Yes, all that. Get the keys, thank you very much indeed, that's very kind of you. 
Up the stairs we go, and I get to a non-smoking floor. Now, in those days, I used to smoke. I used to smoke three packs a day. Terrible. Now I just drink. Excuse me. <laughs> Delicious. Very good brand of water they have here. <laughs> so we go all the way up, and I'm on a non-smoking floor. Now, we're in San Francisco. We're in America. My... He's huge, actually. Bill was. He was huge. He, he said, don't worry, leave the bags here. I'll go downstairs and I'll sort it all out. So he goes down and, uh, yes, please, Mr. Lobberton? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, now, Mr. Herman, um you've put him on a non-smoking floor. Ah, oh, yes, yes, you say so. Here, he said, yes, he said, well, you see... He does like to have a fag in his room before he goes to bed. <laughs> this, this girl went purple. She did. She went absolutely purple. But <clears throat> we got by, we got by through that. I, um, my dear old mum followed me around, you know, knowing where I was and everything else. And the, the marvellous thing is I, I phone her, you see, uh, all the time. I know in, in Are You Being Served, Mr Humphreys phones his mother, and the writers actually got that from me, because every Sunday I used to phone my mum. Well, that's another thing they ask in America as well. They say, how is everybody? <laughs> you know, they don't know how long ago it was. <laughs> how is everybody? And I say, well... Um, young Mr. Grace is dead. Mr. Granger's dead. Mr. Harmon's dead. Uh, Mr. Goldberg is dead. And uh, I'm not feeling very well myself. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you see, our crowd, um, they were very, very nice people. Molly Sugden, an absolute joy to work with. Uh, Wendy, Frank Thornton. Uh, who's not as pompous as he looks, you know. He's, he's, uh, he, he's very nice indeed. Um, and Nicholas Smith, big ears, jug ears, whatever. Uh, they, were, they were very pleasant. All that period of my life, the th 13 years it was, it was just wonderful because it really wasn't like going to work. It was, well, it was like going to a party, really. We laughed a lot. Far too much, in fact, because... No, we used to get into terrible trouble uh, because David Croft used to come out onto the gantry from the uh, control box, look down on the studio floor and say, Will you pull yourselves together? <laughs> yeah, he, was, he used to get very angry with us. And, of course, our, our very last episode that we did... We laughed so much. Everybody thought we were crying because we were sad. <laughs> and we weren't. Because Molly and Wendy went to the makeup room so many times to have their eyes fixed and their mascara fixed because they were laughing so much, they were crying. <laughs> and all the, all the um, usherettes and whatever, you know, they all thought that we were sad because it was the last one. And really, we were relieved in a way. <laughs> I've just been to Australia this year, early this year, to do the stage version of Are You Being Served, which was a huge success. I won't do it again because I'm too old to go mincing round a counter. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was all very, very good indeed. I went on a plane. It's a long way, isn't it? <laughs> and I said to the girl, I said, I, I, I don't feel terribly well. She said, use the bag in front. Well, I didn't even know the woman. <laughs> But they were very nice to me out there, very nice indeed. I was doing a big tour uh, of a play in foreign parts. I quite, quite like working in foreign parts. Um, and I was doing this tour where we opened, we actually opened in Dubai. It was quite exciting for me because I had never been, and I thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful. I shall be able to sit by the pool and get nice and brown because we were rehearsing there as well. And uh, when I got there, it was raining. It was absolutely 
persisting down. It was awful. It was just... <laughs> And I didn't know what to do, and I, I went to, to my hotel room, and I thought, well, I don't know what to do here. And there was nothing to read, not a Gideon in sight there, you know. I mean, <laughs> and so I sat there, and I thought, now, what should I do? And I thought, I know, I'll phone my mother, and I'll tell her where I am. Bless her. Uh, so I did. You can do it, you see. It's very hard work. It takes a lot of, a lot of work, and, and it goes all the way to Blackpool. All those funny noises. And then I heard... Purr, 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 purr. This little voice said, Hello. <laughs> I said, Hello. She said, Hello. <laughs> Who's that? I said, It's John. She said, John who? <laughs> and I said, It's me, your eldest boy. She said, oh, where are you? I said, Dubai. She said, goodbye. And I'm up. <laughs> well, I suppose the comedian I admire most of today is Ken Dodd, because uh, he just talks and talks and talks and keeps going. He's a, he's a very clever man. He's a self-taught man, I believe, because he's wonderful to talk to. He's very, very interesting. And he can be a bit mean. <laughs> no, he can, because I was in Eastbourne. I was doing a play called Pajama Tops at the Devonshire Park. And he was at the Congress uh, doing the Ken Dodd show. And I'd got a little bit of business in the play with a feather duster, you see. So I thought, oh, it's silly just using a feather duster. I'll go and see Ken, because he is a... a friend and marvellous to talk to after the show I'll go and see him and get a tickling stick instead you see so I went and we had a drink after the show and when I say after the show I'm talking about half past two in the morning because you know. <laughs> it goes on and on and on and he bless him he said of course you can have a tickling stick oh I said thank you very much he said, it'll be £2.40. <laughs> and that reminds me, I must go. 